Okay, I guess we can get started. You guys have any questions before we get going? Okay, so we've been kind of plotting along with some background information for a couple weeks. Today we get kind of in depth into some of the concepts that we're going to use the rest of the semester to look at different environmental issues and mostly come to an understanding of how water, soils, rocks respond to things that humans do to them. Humans love to mess with nature. We're great at that. We dig things, we build things on the ground, we mess with soils, we mess with water, we mess with rocks. That's really the essence of what humans do. We interact with nature and, and sometimes in not the most efficient, calm way possible. We can be pretty brutal on the land, as you may notice. So what we're gonna start getting into is how the land responds to things that we do to it. And we're gonna take kind of a physics engineering approach. Now, none of this is gonna be super difficult, but I will tell you that the next two class periods in particular are probably gonna be the hardest that we have all semester. So we're gonna get into a little physics. How many of you have had a physics class? Okay, a couple of you have. So you'll get some review. I'm assuming nobody's had any physics, okay? So even for those of you who have had it, it'll be a little bit of review. I'm not gonna spend tons of time reviewing it, but just get everybody enough so that we can kind of understand the big concepts. And what I wanna to get to ultimately is how water, soils, and rocks respond to things we do to it. And in order to come to that understanding, we have to know a little bit about force and stress and things like that. So we have to have a working vocabulary. The math will be simple, it's just algebra. But there's going to be quite a few units that might be new to you. And it just takes a little time to get used to it. But I'm gonna talk about this stuff all semester. So you won't just see it the next two class periods, okay? So we'll go through the next two class periods. It'll be probably more in depth than you've seen some of this material in the past, but I'll refer back to it again and again and again as the semester goes on, and hopefully you'll start to get comfortable with it. Okay, so we are going to really talk about water today from a molecular standpoint. Try to understand how that little tiny water molecule, how it's put together and how it affects its behavior. So let's take a look at the water molecule. You guys all know water's H2O, right? Two H's and an O. And this is what that little water molecule looks like. Um, so you can see the two H's on the bottom. They're a little smaller than the oxygen. What's really important to get out of this diagram is two things. One is that the angle between the hydrogens is a hundred about 105 degrees so right here you can see that that angle is about 105 degrees now if you want to put together some sort of geometry some geometric shape like a cube or a rectangle or a triangle the types of angles you're usually talking about are 90 degree angles, if you're looking at right angles for a square, cube, rectangle. Or if you're looking at triangles, a lot of times you're looking at 60 degrees, 120 degrees. 105 degrees is a really odd angle to try to make some sort of geometry out of it, okay? That becomes important when we talk about how water and ice, liquid water and solid ice, how they respond together, okay? The other thing that you might see on here are a couple of little symbols. So you got one right here, a little plus, another plus over here, and then some minuses over here. We're gonna talk about this in a minute, but basically your water molecule has two sides to it. It has a negative side, where the oxygen is, and it has a positive side where the hydrogens are. And the reason that exists is that oxygen is an element that hogs electrons. 
It likes to hog electrons. It likes to pull all the electrons in a molecule over by it. It likes to gather them all up. So the electrons tend to hang out more by the oxygen in this bonded molecule. And because all the electrons are hanging out by the oxygen and because electrons are negative in charge, it gives that molecule a little bit of a negative side to it. And we'll come back to that in a minute. It actually has a huge effect on how water behaves. Okay, so the two most important things from this diagram is that there's a 105 degree angle between the hydrogens and the oxygen and the other hydrogen. So it can't make a good geometry when you try to bond these molecules together. And the molecule has a positive end and a negative end to it. So these positive and negative ends are something that chemists call dipoles. They're just slight charges that exist on a bonded molecule. And it has to do with a property that we're going to talk about in a minute called electronegativity. Electronegativity is a property that all elements have. And it really refers to how strongly an element wants to gather electrons around it. So in this case, oxygen is a very electronegative element. Hydrogen is not, so the oxygen tends to hog all of the electrons that exist in that bonded molecule. We'll get to this more in a second. Okay, last class. We talked a little about isotopes. Remember, elements are all atoms that have the same number of protons. And isotopes are variations of an element. And the variation has to do with the number of neutrons. So when we look at hydrogen, hydrogen's atomic number is one. It means it has one proton. Some varieties of hydrogen only have that proton and they are called H1. There's a variety of hydrogen that has one proton, that's what makes it hydrogen, but also has a neutron that makes it H2. And then there's a variety of hydrogen that has its one proton, which makes it hydrogen, but has two neutrons, and that's H3. We talked a little about these isotopes last class. H3 is the radioactive isotope. It has a really short half-life. We'll get into that in a minute as well. So hydrogen has three isotopes. H1, H2, H3. Sometimes H2 is called deuterium. Sometimes H3 is called tritium, so you have hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium, but they're all hydrogens, okay? H1, H2, and H3. H3 is the radioactive one, short half-life, about five and a half years. We talked about it a little a couple of class periods ago where it can be used for forensics, tracking the dates of anything that has water in it. I'm not going to get back into that today. Now, as it turns out, oxygen has some isotopes as well. The most common is O16. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight, which means it has eight protons. All forms of oxygen have eight protons. But we have three isotopes, O16, O17, and O18. So O16 is the variety that has eight protons and eight neutrons. O17 is the variety that has eight protons and nine neutrons. 
and O18 is the variety that has 8 protons and 10 neutrons. O17 is kind of an oddball. We don't deal with it much here on Earth because it's cosmogenic, which means it's produced out in space. We have really tiny amounts here on Earth, but if you see a lot of it, it's usually because it's something that came in from space. Comets have lots of O17 in it. So if you put together the three isotopes of hydrogen and the three isotopes of oxygen, you get a variety of different, you can think of them as flavors of water, isotopic varieties of water. So you can have HHO16, HHO17, or HHO18. You could also have an HDO16 and HDO17, HDO18. You have a DDO17. DDO16, DDO18, we could add tritium in there as well and add three more, but we're not going to do that for now. So there's lots of different isotopic varieties. And if you add up the weights of all these, they're all slightly different. Some are lighter, some are heavier. That affects things like their melting point, boiling point. We'll get into all that here in a little bit. Okay, any questions so far? Pretty basic. Okay, the 105 degree angle we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Not the best angle to make stable geometric shapes out of, which is what we need to make a good solid. All right, I want to talk about those little charges on the ends of the molecule for a minute. Those things that chemists call dipoles. Slight charges on the end of a molecule that greatly affect how they behave. So when you guys, you've all had some chemistry. I know you've all had chemistry some point in your life. What are the, what are the most common types of bonds that you're taught in chemistry? You have covalent bonds, which means what? Just sort of a simple definition for a covalent bond. Yeah, something to do with like sharing electrons. Yeah, it's where you have one atom here, one atom there. They share the electrons, and they're held together by sort of this electron glue. What's the other kind of bond that you commonly discuss in your chemistry class? You guys remember? Ionic. ionic bond. What's an ionic bond? Yeah, so in an ionic bond, one of the atoms takes the electrons from the other one and therefore becomes an ion. You guys remember an ion from a couple of class periods ago? It's a charged atom. So if you have an atom that steals an electron, it becomes a negatively charged ion, right? And then it's going to be held together to a positively charged ion that lost its electron. I want you to kind of unlearn that today, okay? We're going to talk about bonding in a way that you usually don't get in your chemistry classes, but really makes sense for how we talk about water, okay? And it has to do with this property that I have listed here on the very bottom called electronegativity. Every atom up on that periodic table there has an electronegativity value. And electronegativity, it has a fancy chemistry definition, but for us, we're just gonna talk about it simply. It's kind of just how badly an atom wants electrons. Some atoms want electrons a lot. If you go back to your chemistry classes that you had, you probably remember talking about electron shells and how atoms want to fill their electron shells. Well, the atoms that are like one short of filling their shells, they want that electron really, really bad, 
right? They really want to fill that shell and become stable. So those atoms tend to have a really high electronegativity. Other atoms may just have one electron in their outermost orbit. And the easiest way for them to get a full shell is just to get rid of that one. So they have a really low electronegativity value. They just want to get rid of that electron. Okay? So electronegativity is a value that's associated with just how badly these atoms want electrons. And it goes back to sort of filling their electron shells. We're not going to get into that today. We're just going to look at the values. Okay? So this is kind of an interesting way to look at the periodic table. Electronegativity values range from zero. If something has zero for electronegativity, what, is, what does that tell you about that atom? They don't, want electrons. they don't want electrons at all. And if you look, you see a group that are zero, and that's right here. Do you guys remember anything about those elements? Noble gases, and what's what defines a noble gas? They have a full shell, right? So they don't want to get rid of any, and they don't want to get any. They just want to be left alone, right? They are happy as clams. So they do not want electrons. They don't want to give electrons. They don't want to get electrons. They just, they're happy. They're done. They are, they're the retired folks, you know? They're not going to work anymore. They're just going to sit there and be themselves. But some atoms have really high electronegativities, negativities, and the highest is this little guy right here, fluorine. Fluorine's a small atom that's one short of having a full shell. It wants an electron really bad to fill that outer shell. So it is the most electronegative atom that we have out there. It wants an electron more than anything else. It is going to steal it. Now, if you think about that, that when you talk about ionic bonding, that's really what we're talking about. Somebody like fluorine who's going to bounce around is going to find an atom that can steal an electron from. And then that fluorine, because it steals an electron, has a negative charge, right? And it's going to be bonded to probably the thing it stole the electron from, which is now going to be positively charged. Okay? In general, electronegativity values decrease as you go down the periodic table and from right to left. Because if you remember, all of the atoms that are over here on the far left side, they just have one electron in their outer shell. The easiest thing for them to become happy is to get rid of it. So they have a low electronegativity. So now what we're going to talk about is combining atoms together that have electronegativity values. What if you combine two carbons together? That's actually really common out in nature. Most of our cell materials have carbon chains in them. Your gasoline, you heard of octane? Octane is eight carbons bonded together with some hydrogens hanging around it. Lots of carbon to carbon bonds out in nature, especially in living materials. So if you have a carbon, what's carbon's electronegativity? Two and a half. And you bond it to another carbon. What's the other carbon's electronegativity? Two and a half. So does either one want the electrons more than the other one? No. When we go back to chemistry, we call that a covalent bond where they're sharing the electrons equally because they have really similar electronegativity values. Now that doesn't mean that at, for any one point in time, remember those electrons, they just sort of zoom around, right? Now it could be that for a brief second, all of the electrons are around one carbon. And at that very instant, the atom that all the electrons are around are gonna have a little negative charge, a little negative dipole. But the other carbon is going to pull them back because it has sort of, the, it's like a tug of war where they're both equally strong, right? One might go a little bit one way, one might go a little bit, but over time they're not going to make any headway on each other. What if you bond, though, a 
fluorine and a hydrogen. Is there an electronegativity difference? Which is higher? The fluorine, right? So when those two bond together, the fluorine's gonna hog the electrons. And HF is actually a pretty common element. It's hydrofluoric acid. So what happens in HF is that the fluorine hogs all the electrons. So it has a little negative dipole. And then on the other side is your hydrogen. And the electrons aren't hanging out over there at all. So it's got a sort of a positive charge. Then when other molecules in the area float by it, they're gonna feel those little charges, those little dipoles. And if those atoms or molecules have dipoles, they're gonna feel them. And they're going to be attracted by all these charges. So these charges are gonna cause these atoms to sort of stick together a little bit, okay? So let's look at some common bonds for a minute, okay? What's the electronegativity difference on an OH bond? Which is important because we're talking about water. What's O? Let me get rid of that line for you so you can see it better. 3.5. And what's H? 2.1. The difference is 1.4, right? It's actually pretty high. What that means is that oxygen is going to hog those electrons. So oxygen is going to have a strong negative dipole and the hydrogen is going to have a strong positive dipole. Okay. What about CH? C is 2.5. Hydrogen is 2.1. There's a slight difference, right? Not a big difference. 0.4 is kind of a small difference. So there'd be a really, really, really weak negative charge on the carbon and a really, 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 really weak positive charge on the hydrogen. But it's so weak that you might not even notice it if you're out in nature. What about CO? Carbon, oxygen. Carbon's 2.5, oxygen's 3.5, difference of one. It's kind of a medium, so this will have medium dipoles. So you're going to have different strength dipoles depending on the difference between them. And we already talked about carbon, carbon, right? Obviously, no difference. Okay, so you guys understand sort of this difference in electronegativity values. The more electronegative, the more they're going to hog the electrons, you're going to get a little negative dipole on those atoms. This is a different way of looking at bonding. I'll, you, can, you can do this two ways. One, you can just copy this down, I'll give you a minute, or you can go back later and just snapshot this into your notes somehow. For those of you who wanna write it down, you don't have to do all of them, maybe just do every other one. If I ever ask you a test question, I'll give you this. I don't expect you to know this. I don't know this. This is, this is not how I want you using your brains, okay? I think it was Einstein that said you should never use your mind as a filing cabinet. Use it to think. Sure, you need some background knowledge in there, but this is not something you need to stick in your brain. I'll give you a second, then we'll talk about it.
Okay, remember a few minutes ago I asked you about ionic bonds? And you remember from your chemistry, your college chemistry, or high school, or middle school, or whatever, that sort of the definition of ionic bonds is that one element takes an electron from another, and then they're held together by the difference in charges. What this chart is saying is that that never really totally happens. It never completely happens because, you remember that electronegativity chart I showed? Except for the noble gases, which never bond with anything, every single element on there had some electronegativity, right? So that means that they have some ability just to pull back electrons every once in a while. But when you bond something with fluorine, for instance, fluorine is so strongly an electronegative, that's going to hog it. But it can't hog it every second of every day forever and ever because the other elements it's going to bond to have a little electronegativity and just for a brief second they might be able to steal an electron or two for a second. And at that point, is that an ionic bond? You know, it's hard to say. So what chemists have come up with is kind of a different way of looking at it where they talk about something called ionic character. If it was a perfectly ionic bond, where one element stole that electron forever and never gave it up, that would be 100% electronegative, okay? But we don't have that, okay? The biggest difference that we can get between elements is about 3.1. We never get a four, okay? We get 3.1, so that means that that more weakly electronegative element can still pull those electrons now and then. But you can think of it for like 91% of the time, it's going to be your sort of classic ionic bond. But you can see that depending on the difference in electronegativity, you get difference in ionic character. If you have essentially very little difference, okay, in this case 0.1, then it's not very ionic at all. It's more like a covalent bond. 1.7 is kind of 50-50. You know, most of the time it's kind of ionic where one of the elements is hogging the electrons, but the other one has some electronegativity, so at other times they sort of share them. So it kind of challenges your old belief that it's one or the other. A lot of bonds are kind of both. And this is what I want you to know is this part right here. We're going to talk about three kinds of bonds in here. Ionic bonds, now they're not true ionic, they're not 100% ionic, but any time that you're over 50% ionic character, we just call that an ionic bond. Okay, you have to realize that the other bonded element can sometimes grab those electrons for a brief millisecond or two, but they have really, really super strong dipoles. Now, if you're in this sort of middle range from 0.5 to 1.69, you have a bond that's called polar covalent. It shares the electrons, but it's not an equal sharing. It's kind of an abusive relationship. You know, one is definitely taking advantage of the other. And then if you're lower than 0.5, the dipoles are so weak, the difference is so small, that there's not a big enough dipole to really matter. So we call that nonpolar covalent. So those are the three bonds that we're gonna talk about in here, ionic, where there's a big electronegativity difference, polar covalent, where it's an unequal sharing, so you have a strong dipole, and then nonpolar covalent, where the sharing is pretty much equal, and the dipoles are so weak that they don't really matter. Okay? So we're going to use this terminology now to try to look a little more at water. Any questions at this point? Anybody need more time with their notes at this point? 
All right. Let's look at the OH bond because that's what's in water, okay? We know oxygen is three and a half. We know hydrogen is 2.1. The difference is 1.4. And if you look at that previous page in outs, that puts you in that polar covalent, that uneven sharing where you have really strong dipoles. So that oxygen is going to hog the electrons. It's going to have sort of a negative end to it. And I want you to think about that. So I'm going to draw out, and there's an oxygen. There's a hydrogen. There's a hydrogen. What kind of dipoles do we have on this? We have strong and negative on the oxygen, positive and positive. What if another molecule of water comes into the area? So we have another H2 over here and it's moving this direction. Remember there's gonna be a little positive here, right? A little positive here, a little negative here. Well, when this gets close enough, this positive right here may very well feel that negative right there. And they're going to stack. They're going to be attracted, right? Now, if this hydrogen here got close enough to that hydrogen here, what would happen? They'd repel. They'd push each other away. Now, when they try to bond together, that's exactly what happens. So when you try to form ice, what this is going to do is these positives are going to try to find some negatives. The negatives are going to push other negatives away. The positives are going to push other positives away. And it's going to try to form a stable geometric arrangement. But that 105 degree angle doesn't make a geometry. It can't make a cube very well. It can't make a triangle very well. And what it ends up doing is trying to do both. And what it does is it has this really inefficient open structure because things don't fit together and you got things repelling and it has a really hard time making a geometry that stays stable. So chemists call it sort of an open geometry where it takes up a lot of space. And what do we know about ice relative to water in terms of its density? It's a lot less dense because these various water molecules can't form a nice tight arrangement. It's big and open. There's a lot of space. So the density is really low because it has this weird geometry. Does that make sense? I'll show you a better diagram than my crappy drawing here in a minute. All right, let me get rid of this. Okay, so water has lots of properties, right? So if water is held together by these sort of pretty strong attractions, what properties of water might that affect? Remember the other day we talked about, you guys did observations of water and you knew some things about water. We just talked about one, the density, right? Can you think of anything else that might be affected by the fact that you have strong dipoles, strong attractions between these things. Yeah, so water has a property called adhesion where it can stick to other things. There's also another property called cohesion where water molecules like to stick together themselves. And you've seen water sort of uh, beat up on surfaces. That's because all those water molecules are more attracted to themselves than they are to the surface that they're sticking on. Okay, so we have adhesion, cohesion. What about something like melting and boiling points? In order to get something to melt or to boil, you have to break bonds, right? And you have strong attractions, you have strong dipoles. So you need a little more energy. So what that means is that things with strong dry poles tend to have higher melting and boiling points than other similar 
molecules of about the same size. So again, strong dipoles from the difference in electronegativity just means strong attractions. And those strong attractions then take more energy to break. I just put this up, I don't care if you remember this, but back in chemistry you may have heard of something called hydrogen bonds or van der Waals bonds. Kind of a third type of bonding that you hear about in your basic chemistry classes. Those bonds are just attractions between dipoles. So that's what we're talking about here. I don't care if you remember this term, but I bring it up just to mesh with your previous knowledge if you remember that. And again, hydrogen bonds are simply van der Waals bonds where hydrogen is involved. It's a really common bond that they talk about a lot in organic chemistry. So hydrogen is a part of a lot of organic molecules. It's actually something we'll talk about here in a second. We're going to look at some organic molecules and how they're different from water. And how that affects how they interact with one another. Okay, so what we just mentioned a second ago is that these strong attractions lead to higher melting and boiling points. Now in general, light molecules, molecules that are put together with the light elements, <coughs> tend to have low melting and boiling points. It takes a lot more energy to get a big giant atom to vibrate in a manner that would break a bond. Now water tends to be a pretty light element. Hydrogen has a weight of one for its most common isotope. And water has a weight of 16 for its most common isotope. So the most common variety of water has a weight of 18. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. That's pretty light. And if you look at other molecules that have weights of around 18, their melting and boiling points tend to be a lot lower. Water is a light molecule, but its boiling point and melting point are really high compared to similarly weighted molecules. It's because these strong dipole attractions on the hydrogen and oxygen require a lot more energy to break apart. It's kind of weird if with the temperatures we have here on Earth, if water didn't have those strong attractions, water at this surface temperature would all be gas. We wouldn't have liquid water. You'd have to be a lot colder. But those strong attractions allow the liquid phase to be stable to much higher temperatures, which is a good thing for us. We have liquid water because of it. We talked about surface tension. Those dipoles create strong attractions between the water molecules. Strong enough that even things like little spiders and stuff can run across the surface of the water. Those attractions are strong enough to allow things to move across the top or surface of them. Without those strong dipoles, water would not have the surface tension it has.
solubility. This is one of the more important uh, properties we're going to talk about today. Solubility is how easily something dissolves in something else. Water dissolves lots of stuff. If you go out in the ocean, you know this. You know that there's lots of salt in ocean water, right? But there's lots of other things besides salt. You can find gold in ocean water, silver, lead. Pretty much every element up on there is going to be found in ocean water. In fact, water's been referred to as the universal solvent. A solvent is something that other things dissolve into. Water is a great solvent. But some things dissolve better in water than others. We know salt dissolves really well in water. Do you know something that doesn't dissolve well in water? Oils, okay? There's a reason. It actually goes back to this electronegativity thing. That's the whole reason why oils don't dissolve in water the way that, say, a salt would. And we'll get to that here in just a second. In general, the one thing I want you to know today is that polar substances like water, remember water is a polar covalent bonded substance, they dissolve other polar covalent substances really, really well. But they don't dissolve nonpolar substances very well. They will dissolve them a little. You can dissolve a little oil in water, but it's just a tiny amount. And I'll show you how this works here in a second. One other way to think about this is, this is the easiest way to remember it, is that like dissolves like. In other words, a polar substance will dissolve other polar substances really well. Nonpolar substances dissolve nonpolar substances really well. If you want to dissolve oil, can you think of something that dissolves oils well? Have any of you ever painted with oil based paint? Okay, oil-based paints are made of oils, right? How did you clean your paintbrush? Paint thinner. paint thinner or? Some people use gasoline, right? Both of those are oils. Paint thinner and gasoline are both oils. Oils dissolve oils. Polar substances dissolve polar substances. So again, solubility, the definition of solubility is sort of right here. It's the ability of a solvent, which is typically a liquid, but sometimes you can dissolve gases in gases. Sometimes you can dissolve gases in liquids, liquids in liquids. Solvent is the thing that solvent dissolves into. So if you think of water as a solvent, you can dissolve solids into water. You can take solid salt, put it in water, and it'll dissolve. You can dissolve other liquids in water. Alcohol dissolves really well in water. And you can dissolve gases in water. If you're a fish, okay, Fish need oxygen, right? Fish don't swim around looking for bubbles. Okay, they don't do that. They just allow water to pass through and their gills extract the dissolved oxygen. You can't see that oxygen. It's like soda pop. You get a two liter bottle of 7-Up, nice clear, and it looks like liquid, right? And then you shake the crap out of it, right? And what happens? Get lots of bubbles. What happens is there's CO2 dissolved in your soda. When you shake it, that comes out of solution into bubbles. 
So you can dissolve gases into liquids as well. The main thing though in terms of the chemistry is to remember that like dissolves like. Polar substances dissolve other polar substances. All right, so you're gonna have to maybe look back. Let me see here, give me a second here. Let me get you an electronegativity charge here. Just take me a second. I want you to figure out which of these two molecules will dissolve best in water. But to do that, you need the electronegativity for these various elements. So let me put up that electronegativity chart that I had a minute ago. I can't go backwards on my PowerPoint, so I gotta pull it up on this other computer. Okay, there's that chart. So go ahead and look at the bonds between nitrogen and hydrogen and carbon and hydrogen. Okay, nitrogen and hydrogen. What's the electronegativity difference? 0.9. And what kind of bond is that? Polar covalent, like water, right? What about CH in methane? What is carbon? 2.5. What's hydrogen? 2.1. What's the difference? 0.4. What kind of bond is that? It's nonpolar covalent, right? So which of those two is more like water? The nitrate, right? So nitrate should dissolve better in water, and it does. So again, look at the electronegativity difference. First for water, O and H. <clears throat> difference of 1.4, that's polar covalent. Back here. So the CH is nonpolar covalent. The NH is more like water in terms of its electronegativity difference, polar covalent. So the strong dipoles on the NH will be more strongly attracted to the strong dipoles on the water. Now think about this. Okay, look at this methane diagram up here, right? C and H. Is there an electronegativity difference between C and H? Yeah, it's small, right? Does that mean it has dipoles? It has small, tiny dipoles, right? So the H is gonna have a little tiny positive charge, right? But it's not very strong. And the carbon's going to have a little tiny negative charge. But these guys over here, this is going to be a big old negative charge and a big old positive charge. And if you have water over here with a big old positive charge and a big old negative charge, The positive charge on the H in the methane, that's gonna be attracted to the 
oxygen in the water, but just not as strongly as this is. So this nitrate's gonna nudge it out. It's gonna just push the other one. The other one wants in, you know. Methane wants in there. It's got a little tiny dipole. It's just not gonna outmuscle the nitrin, the nitrate, or other water molecules. Think of it this way. What if you had lots of these mixed with lots of water? Lots of methane mixed with lots of water. Methane has little tiny dipoles, right? It's attracted to the big strong dipoles over here, right? But what's gonna be more attracted? The other water molecules. So the water molecules are gonna hang out together because they're attracted to each other with all these really strong dipoles. And then these guys are gonna be forced to stick around each other. And if you mix organic molecules like oils with water, the same thing happens. So that's why oils and waters don't mix because the water molecules are more attracted to each other than the organic molecules are. So that's why oils and waters don't mix very well. Any questions on that? So this is just a way of taking these electronegativity differences and coming to some understanding of how water behaves in a different way. All right, this is alcohol. Look at this molecule for a minute. And tell me if you think it's gonna dissolve well in water and why. I already told you the answer. Why is this gonna dissolve well in water? Do you have some dipoles on these elements? So you've got this Right here, right? You've got an H and C bond. You can go back in your notes and you'll see that that's a really tiny electronegativity difference. That's a nonpolar covalent bond. Is that going to be attracted to water more than water is attracted to water? No. But what do you have right here? You have the exact same dipoles that you have on the water molecule. In fact, the water won't be able to tell this from other water molecules in terms of how strong the charges are. So this stuff dissolves great in water. And in fact, you can sort of look at it. If you've ever seen alcohol that's 150 proof, 75% alcohol, you can't see any differences, right? It's all mixed together. It's all dissolved well. The alcohol doesn't separate from the water it's dissolved into. They all sort of co-mingle very well. And that's just because you have essentially the exact same bond in alcohol that you do in water, but only on one half of the molecule. What about this? This is octane. This is what's in your gasoline. Octane means eight oct carbons surrounded by hydrogen. You basically have two kinds of bonds in here, right? You have the carbon, the carbon bond. What's the electric negativity difference? It's the same. And then you have carbon hydrogen. Very small difference, right? Very tiny dipoles. When you throw this in water, water is going to be more attracted to other water molecules than it is to this. So they're going to be what's called immiscible. They don't mix together. They don't dissolve in one another. So they separate. So you can kind of look at these electronegativity differences and figure out just how well something's going to dissolve in water. This, not very well at all. Any questions on that? All right. Have you heard of capillarity? That water has capillary action. Yeah, if you haven't heard this, you've probably seen it. And in fact, water has the ability to sort of climb up some substances. If you've ever 
put a piece of paper in water, you'll see that water can actually travel up above the water surface. When water sticks to other surfaces, that's called adhesion. When water sticks to other water, that's called cohesion. And both of those are made possible by the fact that water has these strong dipoles. There's an example there of some dyed water climbing up a piece of toilet paper or paper towel. So it's fighting gravity, right? So how does it do that? How does it climb? Well, the water molecule has these little dipoles, right? So it feels charges on the paper and the water molecule sort of sticks and it can rotate its way up. It can stick to other water molecules and sort of hop on their back and climb upwards just by these attractions that are stronger than the gravity pulling it down. So this diagram sort of shows two possibilities. Okay, so the water in the top and bottom diagram is the blue, okay, and the surface is the red. And we have two surfaces here. The first surface here on top essentially has no dipoles or super weak dipoles. So if it has super weak dipoles, is the water going to be strongly attracted to it? No, it's going to be more attracted to the other water molecules. So it's going to beat up on top. All right, if I put a drop of water on this tabletop, it's just gonna bead because there's not a lot of charges on the surface. But if you put a surface that has a lot of charges and those charges are sort of equal to the charges between the water molecules, charges don't know the origin, so they're gonna stick to the surface as well as they stick to other water. And that's what's showing down here on the bottom is these water molecules being attracted to some of the charges that are on the surface. Paper has really strong charges on it. So water loves to go up paper. Now, if you took that paper and dipped it in oil and shoved it in uh, water, would it climb up it? No, because it doesn't feel the charges on the oils very well. Okay. So again, molecules sticking together, it's called cohesion. Molecules that stick to other surfaces, adhesion. Two properties that, again, makes water kind of unique. Okay, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Another property that water has that makes it really unique. In fact, this is one of the properties that really separates water from all other substances in the known world. Most of the time when things go from solid to liquid, they get more dense. Usually those atoms arrange themselves in a geometry that's really tight and efficient, much more so than the water. Because in water, molecules have to have enough space to move around one another. Usually when you freeze things, they become locked into place really tight together and they don't move. So solids tend to have a denser, tighter structure. But water is one of the few things that does just the opposite. When it freezes, it takes up more space. And it's because of that weird 105 degree angle. It can't form rectangular structures very well because it doesn't have a 90 degree angle. 
it doesn't form hexagonal structures very well because it doesn't have 120 degree angles. It doesn't form pyramidal structures very well because it doesn't have 60 degree angles. It's kind of halfway between what you would need to make a rectangle and a hexagon, 90 versus 120. And because it can't do either, it kind of does both and does both really poorly. So it makes crude hexagon rectangles. It, they just don't fit together very well. So it forms this open, inefficient geometry that takes up a lot of space. And I can't drop, I have a diagram coming up here in a second that I hope will illustrate it a little better. Okay, so on the left is liquid water. Okay, you can see all the water molecules on the left, right? Every little molecule has two little tiny blue hydrogens, one big fat red oxygen. And what it's showing on the left is in water, you have lots of dipole attractions. You have lots of hydrogens being attracted to oxygens. You can see that right here. You can see it right here. You can see it right here. Anywhere you see these dashed lines. But it's a liquid. Remember, everything's moving relative to one another. So those bonds are easily broken because there's enough energy, there's enough vibration to come over, to overcome those attractions. So they feel the attractions, but they're vibrating so much that they break them really easy. So that's why we call these unstable hydrogen bonds. But when we take enough heat away and take enough vibration away, they're going to try to lock into place. And when they do, they form, you can see these structures here, right? They kind of look like a, a hexagon, right? But not a very good hexagon. And then you get these sort of molecules that don't go anywhere. <laughs> they just don't fit in, right? And the fact, look at the space then between all these. Lots of space between the molecules here and the ice, right? The solid water, not as much over here because they can move and fill in the spaces. Here they have to find a geometry where they're stable, but they don't make good, consistent hexagon or rectangular geometries. They have to find a more stable arrangement and to do so, they take up more space. So for that reason, solid water, ice, is less dense and quite a bit less dense than liquid water, 10%. So it floats. The world would be a really different place if ice were, think of a lake, okay? If ice didn't expand, okay, and you're in cold country like here in the winter, how would ice freeze in a lake? Say it. From the bottom up right and what would happen is our lakes would totally freeze because what happens now is you get a layer of ice on top and then it insulates the water underneath and it allows fish to live all year long all these aquatic things to live all year if water didn't do this our aquatic life would be very different we would basically we wouldn't have it extending year to year in cold climates i know one place actually there's several places where water does freeze from the bottom up. It's so weird. There's a stream in South Dakota, it's a mountain stream, it freezes from the bottom up. And it has to, it only happens when you have really fast moving water, okay? So what happens is the water cools off when it gets really cold and it'll cool below 32 degrees C. But the water is moving so fast that nothing can bond together. But the water is below the freezing point and it's still liquid. But it's staying liquid because the water is just moving down the steep slope. 
So where in your stream would water stop moving so that ice could form? At the bottom where there's rocks and things, you get these little pools of water behind rocks where the water won't move very fast, it'll freeze. So you look out and there'll be ice right along the rocks on the bottom of the, of the stream. Where it stays moving fast, it never freezes. It moves so fast all year long that that stream never freezes. But you get a layer of ice on the bottom. The weirdest thing. But the whole thing doesn't freeze. It's called a super cool liquid. It can get below the freezing point and stay liquid from agitation. Okay, just a couple more things and we'll leave this for today. We're sort of walking through all the properties of water and looking for a chemistry basis for understanding why water behaves the way it does. This one's kind of interesting. It becomes important a little later, especially when we talk about groundwater. This is a really important property for groundwater. And it's that water is incompressible. You can't squish it and make it small. Some things you can. If you squish it, it becomes smaller. Water is not, essentially. It's, it's a tiny bit compressible. But for most applications, we ignore it's tiny bit. And we just say it's incompressible. So what's kind of neat is there's lots of pressure in the earth, right? And we have rocks that have little bitty openings. Things like sandstones have little openings between sand grains. And water can get in there. And as they get buried deeper and deeper, they get under more pressure. But that rock can't collapse because the water can't collapse. So the water keeps those little void spaces open. Now, when you pull the water out, if you have a well and leave air in there, air is really compressible. So that rock can compress and smash shut those openings. And what that does is it kills your groundwater aquifer. No more water can flow in. So water acts as a support system down in the ground because it's incompressible. Now, in actuality, it's a tiny bit compressible. And like I said, we ignore it for the most part. The one place where we don't ignore that is out in the oceans. The oceans, because they're so vast and so deep, if, you, if, the, if water was truly incompressible, the oceans would actually be about 100 feet higher than they are today. But because of that tiny bit of compressibility in the really deepest part of the oceans, water compresses a little bit, and it sort of shrinks the size of the water column just a tiny bit overall. But now that's significant, obviously, if you live in a coastal region. Water would be 100 feet higher if it weren't compressible. But, you know, like I said before, for the most part, we just ignore this. Especially when there's small amounts, like in a void space and rock deep in the earth. Okay, we are going to stop here because this next section. We spent today basically talking about chemistry, right? Next class, we're going to talk almost totally about physics, force and mass. And if you haven't had that, don't freak out about it. I'll give it to you in the same sort of manner. You'll be able to understand it. So we're going to talk about pressure. Pressure is really important in terms of how water behaves. But I'll save that for the next class. All right. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Do your lab. I sent you an email this morning about lab and other things. Take a look at that. We're going to have an exam coming up in a few weeks. I don't know when yet. I want to get through this water background chapter before we announce it. If you have any questions, make sure you email me. We can talk before or after mm. class or mm. if you're doing this online or don't mm. want to come in we can set up a zoom mm. meeting or something i can help you through that whether it's stuff from lecture or the topographic maps so don't let your map stuff go too long <laughs>